As the first black supermodel, she revolutionized an industry that hesitated to acknowledge those who were different. Despite her struggles with shyness and looks she described as nothing special, she took New York and then the world by storm. From there, she built a cosmetics empire, stretched her acting legs in numerous films, and married pop superstar David Bowie. Hi, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on this episode of Interviews, our conversation with international supermodel Iman. your career how do you judge success um, uh, by what you inspire other people to do really yeah I think that's what's really success is it's not what you achieve or what you gain it's what you really inspire other people to do did you always see it that way in the beginning of your career would you have answered that question the same way no it would have all been about me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's in it for me it would have been that yeah what made that change then for you I think age, uh, you, uh, you accumulate some kind of a wisdom. Uh, you see how you affect other people's lives in uh, small ways that become big ways. Yeah. Self-esteem is a big issue, um, as little as it is. And as everybody thinks that especially pretty people or pretty girls have it. Uh, and kids, you think they are born with... Uh, exuberance and innocence, but their self-esteem can be taken away so easily. That simple thing that I do uh, in my in my uh, career as a model, and then especially as a CEO of Iman Cosmetics, has been really huge for me. Mm-hmm. It galvanized the whole generation of young girls to think of themselves differently. So to me, that is you know that is an inspiration to me to see people, young girls, changing right in front of my eyes as they grow up and, and saying, yeah, yeah, I am too beautiful, yeah. Did you ever feel you were on the evil side of that? That when you were being photographed and the image and all that, that that was projecting that kind of surface beauty is so important? And did you ever feel like, wait, I've got to fight against that image? I, I never felt that I had to really fight against that uh, because simply when I came to America in 1975, um, I came from... Uh, I was already a fully formed young adult. I was 18 years old, but I've already been uh, a a daughter of a diplomat. My mother was a a doctor. I was in boarding schools. I had a privileged life. And then all of a sudden, in in a wink of an eye, everything was taken away. We had to flee in the middle of the night Mm -hmm. uh, on a van, cross a border with nothing but the clothes on our back. And so I've seen it from the have and have nots. How old were you at that uh, I was uh, 15. Okay. And coming to uh, Kenya and being at the mercy of the government and the government giving us refuge and giving us children uh, scholarships for education, but to a limited amount of years, so we had to fetch for ourselves. And to having seen that and then all of a sudden a turnaround and being so what they call discovered and becoming a model and then all of a sudden having lots of money. Right. At an early age, also at the age of 18, 19, uh, I have a, quite a good re- perspective of what money is about and what fame is about and how fleeting it is. Can you still remember the feelings that you had when you were 15? Can you still remember that fleeing? Uh, I, when I was 15, I had absolutely n- n- uh, no self-esteem. I was a very studious, nerdy little girl and... and, and Nobody has ever said I was beautiful, so beauty was not something that was even spoken, at least not around me. <laughs> uh, and people don't believe me when I say this because people just, obviously, they look at you as you are now and then they think that that's how you were always. And most of the people, most of the women I know that are beautiful are the most complicated and not self-assured of themselves. Um, obviously, there also there are those ones who are too assured of themselves right. because of their beauty. So it comes in two ways. But when I was 15, I, uh, I was so introverted, I had no idea what it was going to be my life about. Yeah. What about when you see these small children that are put in these circuit pageants and all oh. of that stuff, or the child models? Yeah. How do you feel about that? 
It's so foreign to me because I've never seen it in any other place but in America. Really? You know, I've never seen any kind of uh, uh, beauty pageants for children in any other country but in America. So it's so foreign to me. Yeah. Uh, and when you see it, that you 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 cringe first because it's so. Um, I won't even use the word evil because there is this glee in the eyes of the children. There is the glee in the eyes of the parents, and so y you can see that there is the intention is not bad, but they, there's nobody have thought through this yeah. and what it could do to the to the kids um, and to those parents who are trapped in their own ways by living vicariously through their children. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a little bit bizarre and surreal and, and sad in a way. Yeah. And I know that you were married, your first marriage, very early age. Yes. If you hadn't been in that marriage, yeah. would you have been discovered? Would you have taken the things that came that way? Do you ever look at it that way? And for people who don't understand, yeah. you were not discovered in the jungles. You were not <laughs> discovered as a sheep herder. You were actually going to university. You were on the streets. Speaking Someone five languages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I always said I was not discovered because I was not lost. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> not boy, like there were plenty. Found me. We found her. No, we are. You didn't there find were plenty me. of stories, though, about <laughs> and, uh, who you were, where I know, you came and, from. And to me, at times, they were um, insulting. And at times, I was a co-conspirator mm -hmm. because when I really knew about it uh, and, and I told the press that that's not true and they still wrote that, then I am a co-conspirator in, in the whole um, fabrication of my discovery and who I was. And, uh, but it, it's amazing that they actually needed a story. Yeah. You know, nowadays, all you have to say is that, oh, I was discovered. You know, right. I, but to make that kind of a fabrication that is so beyond uh, uh, imagination, and you think, why did anybody need it in 1975? <laughs> you know, right. we're not talking about 1945 or 1800s. <laughs> boy, it, it certainly gave you a story. It certainly shot you to the Absolutely. top of the charts. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm to think of it in hindsight now, as much as I was upset with them at that time, to me, it's, that is the auspices of how I started. Yeah. Yeah. But to go back a little bit, when you're talking about you were married yes. and it wasn't a perfect marriage yes. from where you were at. Well, no marriage is a perfect marriage, right. <laughs> by the way. But you weren't happy in this yes. marriage. Yes. And so the opportunity comes to come to America. Yes. Come here and be a model. We've taken these photos of yes. you. You're popular. Come with us. Yeah. You go because you're trying to get out of this marriage in some way. Uh, in, in a way, also, yeah. First, trying to get out of the marriage. Uh, secondly, trying to uh, find what could happen. Uh, I've always been a firm believer that if you just take that road, what the outcome would be? Would it be right. so different? You know, like your whole life could be totally different. But one thing I've definitely insisted on before I left Africa was that I wanted, uh, with all the contracts, everybody was saying, oh, I'll give you a contract. By the way, the contracts don't mean anything unless it's guaranteed. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and in modeling, there's nothing guaranteed. <laughs> um, so uh, what I asked for was a return ticket. Because the last thing I wanted is to be stuck in a foreign country, and I had no way back home. So I had that, foreign, uh, that, uh, that return ticket. Right. So that was my way back. But it was a way to escape that and, and just see. And, and, and mind you, I was a girl who was never have been called beautiful. And now there's a world that thinks I'm beautiful. I'm going to go and explore it. Yeah? Yeah. And, and it's, um, it was not, uh, it's not what I expected. It was. It became something else. When you first got here, were you surprised at the way both Africans and African Americans are treated in this country? I know you make a distinction about the two different groups too, yes. the way they're treated. Uh, yes, because you know, I, I found uh, when I arrived here in 1975 that Americans have some kind of a. Uh, uh, they give a carte blanche if you're a foreigner, uh, rather than especially blacks. If you are a, uh, uh, from the islands, a Caribbean descent or an African descent, it's different than an African American. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the the level of racism is different. Yeah. You know, we we as Africans were given a little bit of a more of a leeway. Yeah. Uh, and and obviously, uh, the African American models at that time in 1975 uh, felt it and felt it quite rightly that why do they have to go to Africa to get a girl when we are here and we can't get a job. 
So uh, the politics of it and the politics of beauty, the beauty industry was not lost on me. Yeah. Um, How do you then deal with all of that going on around you? How is it that you work through that when you're pulled into a system like that? Yes. Um, thank God I had some kind of a, a understanding uh, in terms of uh, politics and how politics works, not in terms of just people think of when they think of politics in terms of politics in the, uh, in the, in the sense of government right. of, or governance. It's not that. There is politics. It could be the politics of beauty, the politics of ethics, the politics of even losing weight or not losing weight. There is a self-esteem, the politics of self-esteem. Politics have a lot of senses in that, that I had a quite understanding of it. And beside that, uh, I was a child of the 60s, so I was quite aware of what was going on in this country, um, both good and bad. I was aware of it, of all its racism and all that. And I was also aware of all its good part from Martin Luther King to J.F. Kennedy Jr. So I knew I was aware of all that. Uh, so I was aware of it is, uh, its good and side, bad side of it. But when I came here, I had to find my place uh, from being called that I didn't look black enough. Uh, so I could not fit in that. Or I, because uh, you know, I, I, and I always <laughs> laughed always about it. I say, I'm, well, I, how much the, more black can yeah, I be? But, but also, <laughs> I am very Somali. The thing yeah. is, this the, the the understanding of that when people say Africa is it's still till today. People when they say uh, talk about Africa, they talk about a whole continent, and they talk about like we're all one group of people. Like nobody says you are European. Right. They say you're Italian, you're French, you're English, you know, German. Nobody says you're just European. Uh, but in Africa, everybody just calls us all Africans, you know, like as if we are just one look fits all. And so, yeah, I mean, I might not look like a West African, but I look very East African. Yeah. You know, I can dime a dozen in my country. <laughs> you know, I'm not <laughs> something, you know, like... Uh, and I, and I, it's, I hated the idea that, that, the, that the, they had a sense of... Uh, uh, being called that I looked like a white girl, but just browner. Yeah. I don't look like a white girl. I look Somali. I look an East African. I look a very Bantu tribe. You know, so that was my, and I'm trying to find my place, but in my own terms, because, you know, I, in, in, my, in my thinking, I don't have to belong to anybody. I know who I am and where I come from, and I don't have to say. The thing is this, I kept on saying, you know, I never considered myself a black woman. Because where I come from, we're all black. Right, you're just a woman. I didn't, have to, right. I didn't have to define myself by saying black. We're all black. So, so that was new to me, to be, to be called by people uh, that so-and-so black model. And I'm thinking, why did I need that definition? Uh, have you seen that change over the years? Oh, no, absolutely not. Uh, there are people who still call me the black wife of David Bowie. <laughs> Really? Yeah. I was like, um, well, yeah, I guess he had a white wife. I guess that's the description. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, don't I don't know. Huh. After all these After, years? Yeah, yeah. There, there are people who are set in their ways. But also, it's very, very clear. And I have to say, it. it's, I mean, the only way that they will describe us at times, unless you're really a known model, and Naomi Campbell, Tyra Banks, Iman, if they know you, then that's not tied on you. But if somebody would have described it, uh, described somebody who doesn't know us, to uh, they would say, "Oh yeah, Naomi Campbell. Yeah, well, that black, black famous model." Right. No, uh, and at times, yes, it applies also to Giselle, the Brazilian model, but never to a Caucasian model. Nobody will say to that white model. Cheryl Teeks, Christy Brinkley, that black, white model. Right. They won't say that. You know? How do you think, though, that affects even today? young African-American, young girls of any color yeah. coming up, hearing things like that still? I have always said, uh, because in the business that I am, it's about photography and images. And I've always said photography is such an important, and, 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 uh, an important tool because uh, the absence of images for young girls to, to see themselves celebrated uh, the absence of those images that look like them makes them feel not 
as good. They feel they're not considered beautiful. They're, what they look like is not beautiful. And the presence of it, of course, feels them validated. Um, so when, when people say, well, what's in a picture? It's a lot in a picture. Right. Uh, you know, if you are constantly bombarded with what is called the standard of beauty, which is blonde and blue-eyed, then that's what you want to be. Or you feel you're not part of that beauty, what's considered beautiful. So the whole thing about the ownership of beauty, the, uh, how to define beauty in your own standard and not wait for somebody else to tell you. Uh, how Salma Hayek properly put it in my, the foreword to my book, if beauty is in the eye of the beholder, then let the beholder be you, not somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say then to your children? What do you say about these things? How do you instill in a child, in any child, to be proud of who you are in a world that bombards you? And it's not only with race, but with beauty. Yes. Because there are just a handful of the super beautiful yeah. in the world. The rest of us don't fit in there. So how do you let them know you're just as good? Uh, the, the, the content. People have forgotten that beauty comes with content. You know, a vacuous beauty, it's an empty shell. It has no value. Do you know what I mean? I have known people who are very, very beautiful and quite ugly. <laughs> you know? Oh, so have I. <laughs> you know, and vice versa. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so the people have forgotten about content, especially now what is celebrated. It's celebrated fame and infamy has no difference now. Everybody is celebrated. You can be a star regardless whatever you have done. You could commit murder, you become a star. Right. <laughs> you commit pornography, you're a star. You could do anything and you could become a star. So that is the, um, the, 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 the stuff that we're teaching kids. And, and I have known, because we do internship at the, at the office, and I, got the, I have young girls who come in at the age 15, and they want to be CEOs. <laughs> what have you done? Right. You know, and they think <laughs> everybody should become quite instantly very successful because we see it in our society that the word it's celebrated, especially in celebrity. It's quite fast. You can become so fast overnight as a star. Mm -hmm. And the kids don't understand what, what a star means. They don't care what it is. They just want to be a name. Yeah. You know? When you hit and you got to America and all of this circus happened, do you ever wonder, because you say you'll go down other roads, yeah. do you ever wonder if it had been a slower burn? If it had happened slower, the fame that came to yeah. you, would you have handled it any differently? No, because you probably, uh, in my situation, I probably could have, would have been very frustrated and left the business quite fast. <laughs> you know? I was like one of those, you know how when you see a duck swimming uh, uh, you know, on a pond or something? It uh -huh. looks from the surface calm, but yeah. down and it's paddling quite fast. <laughs> I was like that. I was learning everything quite as fast as I could. And then there was the obstacles that were on the way that, uh, that I knew that I had that I was uh, disposable to the business. As mm -hmm. a black model, I was disposable. There was no really uh, uh, a very uh, value that they placed on me. It was the political correct thing to do. Uh, and so how do you create a self and a place for yourself in an industry that you are part of? Either you get out of it because you just get frustrated and you don't want to deal with it, or you find a way to make a, to make a really... A value for your for yourself and what they think about you and 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 all the people that will come behind you. Obviously, you do, when you're doing that, you're not thinking about the people who are coming behind. You're thinking about yourself and and what is this about? And because they devalue you, right? You know, as especially as a black man, they devalue because you always know that there is no you have no value. This we need to do this because it's the politically correct thing to do. Otherwise, it's really not important. I would almost say, though, that there are models out there who don't realize that, that there are people in any walk of life that don't realize that they can be disposed of. Yes. And that that's where a lot of danger comes when people don't realize that, I mean, then, then they find themselves out there without a net. And absolutely. And that, for me, that was my net. It's either I find a way to make this thing work for me so I feel that I am a person and I have a sense of value and that I am valued at what I'm doing. Otherwise, there is no reason for me to do this. I have to find something else to do. And hence, it started really from asking the, the, the price of, of, of services because we weren't paid the amount of money that our counterparts were paid for the same services we were doing. So I learned quite fast to say no. I mean, I'll set it out, so <laughs> no big deal. 
you know, you, you don't need me, I don't need you. Okay, fine, so everybody goes to their corners. <laughs> <laughs> and let's start it again, you know. And so, and I wanted what I called the spoils of war. Because in our industry, there's where you make money and the rest of it is fluff. Mm-hmm. What you do in what's called editorial in the magazines, they pay you $250 a whole day. That's not money. There's prestige in it, but that's not money. Advertising, cosmetic contracts, that's where the money is. That's where they may pay you half a million, million dollars for jobs. That's what I wanted. I wanted that spoils of war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I fought for. Was it out of, and I don't mean this disrespectful, but was it out of greed or was it out of wanting to be valued? It's about a value system. Okay. If you're going to pay that amount to another girl, why couldn't you pay me for the same service I, I provided? It's about that. Is about that. It's not about greed because if you know, because at the sense, if it, usually people who are about greed, they will prostitute themselves. They'll do whatever it takes to get there. And uh, my sense of value was that I'll sit it out, either but, they'll come my way or no way. But you also have to believe in yourself. Did yes. you ever doubt yourself during all of that? Uh, never doubted myself. I doubted my looks, but I never doubted my services. Did you ever think, well, am I good enough looking to be getting yes. this money? Am I performing? And if they come my way and pay me that money, I have to, do, I have to right. deliver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because at the end of the day, you have to sell. Yeah. If they use you in this major advertisement for that major money, you, that product has to move. Does you that know? drive you insane? Well, that drives you insane because at the same time, because you won't get hired again Yeah. for that. So, so you are as good as your last uh, ad yeah. <laughs> and how well it did. I guess 89 or so is when you decided to walk away from modeling. Yes. And you did it. Cold. Clean cut. No, you weren't going to go back? It wasn't? Clean. Nothing. How did you come to that decision? I'm the only one who has ever done it. I know. Apparently. <laughs> and I was like, well, yes, I, I, at least I could claim that. I had enough money. I, 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 I was made sure that I saved enough money so I won't be sucked in. Because it's a business that is so, such, so easy to make money at times. Mm-hmm. So I... Um, I, I just made sure that I wanted a clean break, and there's no way to really find what you really want to do, what's your second act, right. till you really stop. You can't be in between and not. Uh, I just wanted to be a calm, quiet place, away from what I did before, so I could think clearly of what's my next phase, what's my second act, what am I doing next. Could someone entice you to come back today? No. They have done it. They have tried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have tried. I have not even been to a fashion show since 89. Really? I'm a woman of my word. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Then, and I know we're running short on time, you went into the cosmetics business yourself because yes. there was no successful or good line for women of color. Yes. How can that be possible? That's very possible and it's still, it's still the same. In 1994, I created Iman Cosmetics, and the past year, as CEO of Iman Cosmetics, skincare and fragrances, I have been singularly the first and only brand who had uh, a, a cosmetics for women, African Americans, Latina, Asian, multicultural, and multi ethnic. Um, I was the only brand who had an SPF in my products because they said women of color don't care about some protection. So the creation, when I was writing two years ago, the, my, my beauty book, which I consider like a beauty tool because mm-hmm. it's about techniques and tips and self-celebration of the all women of with sin of color. Yeah. Uh, it, I wanted it really that to celebrate that from the darkest, darkest of African beauty to a blonde, blue-eyed uh, Brazilian model Pakistani, Indians, everybody in between celebrated and have young girls that are celebrated nowadays from Ava Mendes, Naomi Campbell, Tyra Bang, Salma Hayek in the book with their baby pictures so that when young girls look at these books that they always are looking at in magazines that they can say one day, I could be just like her when I grow up. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that the reason that there wasn't a line of cosmetics for for women of color was because of prejudice? Because obviously they have the buying power out Absolutely. there. Why did it never happen? It takes a lot of investment. It takes a lot of self-investment. It takes a lot of 
grassroots. It takes a lot of understanding what makes all these people different, what their specific needs are. The industry doesn't have that time. They're in it. It is about the bottom dollar. So what it is is that, okay, if you have five shades or six shades or eight shades for Caucasian women, put two more colors, make it darker, and you can claim it that it's for everybody. So they don't have to, and then they can spend a lot of money and have a celebrity endorse it, and they don't have to do anything on the product. At the, but at the surface, look like they're doing for all women of all color. Right. Last question. We're just about out of time, and I hate that it's gone so quick. A tip to people watching that people do wrong with their makeup. Ah, uh, I would say the singular one is that they, you, they always choose the wrong foundation for them. The perfect shade is a shade that looks like you. And the only way to test it is test it on your jawline. The color that you don't see. Choose two, three colors. Put it on your jawline. Strip them. The one you don't see is the perfect shade for you. That's your skin color. There. A tip and everything. Iman, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Real quick, how's David doing? David is doing fantastically well. <laughs> fantastically well. <laughs> He's home babysitting. <laughs> oh, so he gets to watch the kid and you get to do the TV. Exactly. Iman, thank you very much. Thank A pleasure. You. Iman. To order a transcript, call 866-652-3378 or send $6.95 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.